Hello everyone, welcome to Jube's 2011 Audio Books and Music Podcast, which recently got changed to Mana's Audio Books and Music Podcast. So, today this is going to be Season 2, Episode 10. Welcome to another episode. And thank you for tuning in. Other than that, uh, I'm going to play episode, my bad, chapter, chapter 31 through 40 of The Forbidden Child, originally, um, what you call a uh, red and narrated by Tannis Clark and Sean Anthony and the writer is Lily Anna L I L L Y then Anna A N N A H All right here goes Chapter 31, The Council, all the way to Chapter 40, which is She Much, which is She Must Die. No music today, but you'll sure get a good time listening. The Council. Eric smiled. I'm so glad to be back. Lisa agreed. After Cassandra asked us to go on this mission, we hit a lot of bumps. Can you tell me who they are? Anderson asked, confused. (laughs) Dad, let me start at the beginning. Eric laughed. After Jesse passed out and told us the battle was upon us, Cassandra pulled Lisa and me aside. I need you to make an arduous journey. It shouldn't take more than a day to get there and back. Please travel to Wyoming, to the council house. We need their assistance as soon as possible. Take this letter. They will not like it, but they will hopefully come. It would be best if you left at once. Cassandra said, handing me a very thick envelope. Lisa and I transformed head and east. There didn't seem to be a threat coming from that direction due to the jagged mountain range. It was rough at first, but Cassandra had told us about the secret tunnels once we reached the boulder shaped like an upside-down wolf. After a while, Lisa stopped, shifting back to her human form, which made me do the same. Lisa pointed out, There is the wolf. She said to stop here. There will be clothes and a pack behind the boulder. We walked closer to the boulder to find them in what looked like a normal giant rock that had been carved out. It was colder up there than we expected. Since we live in Southern California, we aren't used to it, even though I grew up here. We got dressed, took the 150 paces due north, and then we found the cave. It was covered by a couple of trees and a boulder, but it was only an illusion. There wasn't anything actually there. Because of the pendant that Cassandra gave us, we were granted access. We slid down for what seemed like an hour, but was maybe 15 minutes. It was so smooth, making me feel like a pup again. At the bottom, where we landed was snowmobiles. Since we were in a hurry, we just took one. When we arrived at the cave opening, we looked at each other and began to panic. There was a few thousand foot drop off. We took a deep breath and trusted that Cassandra wasn't sending us to our death. As we passed the mouth of the cave, our snowmobile turned into some kind of helicopter. We were gliding through the air, thankful we had helmets and headsets. I love you. That was scary. But dying with you would be a lot better than dying alone. I am grateful that we trust our maker. 
Lisa said as she hugged me tighter. I love you too, I replied. We hovered for a moment as Lisa looked at the directions that Cassandra had given us. We had traveled for about two hours at this point. Lisa pointed to a large forest shaped like an arrow. We followed it for what seemed like hours. Then we saw the most beautifully structured mansion tucked away in a very secluded area. If we hadn't been in the sky, we wouldn't have been able to see it. I smiled. There she is, honey. <laughs> yeah, I hope they hear us out. I know Cassandra said they would at least look at the request because it was from her. I just can't help but be worried. Sign, Lisa stated. We lowered the automobile down slowly. The guards directed us where to park. Once landed safely, the two dozen guards surrounded us. Stay your business, the head guard, Marco, said. We are here on a mission from our maker, Cassandra. She said to give Marco this envelope, I said, as Lisa held it out. Marco took it, holding his hand in the air. Stand down! All the guards moved back to their post, and Marco looked back at us. Come this way. And I will take this to them. He led us into the mansion. It was something out of the 15th century. I have no words to describe it other than that. Uh, wow. You, why yeah? Marco showed us to a lobby foyer area where there are about a dozen or so seats. We sit down. Holding hands with one another, we began to pray to the moon goddess for her blessing in seeing the council. We must have waited for about two hours or so. We were so tired we dozed off. Marco touched my shoulder, shaking it lightly. They will see you now. Follow me. As we followed Marco, the hallway seemed like an endless maze. The walls were covered with art from painters of every era. I was awestruck. As we reached the rotunda, there was a painting that caught my attention. It looked like Schuyler's wolf, but half of it was a fire wolf, and she appeared to be staring at a mirror image of herself. The ground under each wolf was different. One side she was covered in ice and snow, while the other was a green meadow with wild flowers. I just stood and stared. Schuyler was a twin, but her twin had died. I wonder if this is what would have happened as she lived. Interrupting Eric, Anderson shouted. Skyler had a twin? Why didn't I know this? I didn't know either. Cassandra frowned. I will tell you more about that day with Jackson and Skyler present. For now, let's get back to my story. Eric smiled and then continued. Marco looked at me. Is something wrong, sir? No, this picture appears to be of my niece's wolf split into two. I didn't know who the other half of the wolves are. Strained and confused, I stated. He motioned us to walk through two huge gold-plated doors. Two armed guards opened them. They held golden swords and wore gold armor. I was again awestruck. State your name. A man in a red robe roared at us. Alpha Eric and Luna Lisa of the Southern California Beach Moon Wolves, I said softly. How do you know, Cassandra? A woman in a white robe asked. Lisa spoke. She arrived at my brother-in-law's territory right before we did. Cassandra asked us to bring our adopted son with us, Mitch. The man in red spoke. These letters are written in an ancient language that Cassandra created only for her first eight wolves to use. So we know these letters are from her. We will not be able to assist you, but we will send four of our children with you. We have not left the council headquarters since it was built over 2,500 years ago. We are too weak to travel now. A man dressed in blue stated. A woman dressed in green walked up to me and just hugged me. You are an ice wolf. Turning to Lisa and hugging her? <laughs> you are a fire wolf. 
However, you have kept the law that we so foolishly wrote, and not had any children. Yes, ma'am. That is correct. Why do you call the law foolish? I asked. She turned and walked back to her spot at the table and sat. We didn't know what true mates were. We thought that we were created to love the wolf that shared our same elemental gene. In the end, I have found that as I, an air wolf, and my true mate, an ice wolf, were meant to be together. We have a daughter named Tabitha. She will travel with you. She took a deep breath. I also have a son with the first Earth Wolf. His name is Andre, and he will go with you as well. The gentleman dressed in blue smiled at us. We are so sorry that you are not able to have children due to our faults. We have rewritten the laws but never sent them to the tribes. We didn't want anyone to know. We had broken our own laws. I will send my son, Dylan. Eliza and I are his parents. I am a firewolf, while she is an airwolf. We also send Betty. She is an airwolf. She is Eliza's daughter from her first mate. Altogether, they said, We, we grant you safety, safety protection, protection, and trust. We send our children with you. They will complete the four mixed wolves. Skyler and Mason will need their assistance to defeat Cordelia. I am Frederick, the first male firewolf. I know my first mate is now a guardian. Her new name is Abigail. Abby. Her mate is Dalton, an earth wolf and also a guardian. They have joined Jerrica and Mitch to complete the guardians from the souls of the other four original wolves. The man in blue smiled. They each introduced themselves. Then they led us to a small plane. Marco flew us straight there. Eric smiled. Let me introduce you to Andre, Betty, Tabitha, and Dylan. Skyler goes home. Mason sits next to Skylar's hospital bed. She looks so peaceful sleeping. He puts his hand in hers and gives it a light squeeze. Skylar, I love you so much. What you did was so brave. He whispers softly to her. Mason was worn out from the training, battle, and lack of food. He closed his eyes as he held Skylar's hand. Soon enough, the sun was shining through the window straight into his face. Uh. Mason grumbled. A giggle answered him. He opened his eyes to the most beautiful face in the world. Well, at least to him. Skylar was smiling. How did you get any sleep in that chair? I'm not even sure. Now I'm stiff and hungry. How are you feeling, my love? Mason began to stretch and stood up. Skylar yawned. Oh, I am still tired. But I want to go see my dad. Jesse came by earlier to let me know that he is in a coma. Yeah, Dr. Melton said he needed his mate to finish the healing. He is completely healed physically thanks to you. However, mentally he is a broken wolf. Only his mate can help him now. Mason smiled. But don't give up hope. Tilly, which is Cassandra's adopted daughter and Cordelia's biological daughter, told Jerrica that the real Sarah is alive at the castle. So her, Mitch, Abby, and Dalton are on their way to find her now. Skylar just shook her head, confused. Cassandra's adopted daughter that she told me about was Cordelia's daughter? Did Cassandra know? Mason shook his head. She had no idea. It is a long story. He looked up as the door opened. Jesse, please tell us you have some good news. Only good news. You are free to leave. However, I know you want to see your father. Jesse smiles. That is going to take some time to get used to. 
I am so glad that they found out. I know he must be feeling pretty crappy about everything. Jessie blushes. I am sorry. I am rambling about things that are none of my business. They all shared a laugh. Skylar dressed in the clothes that Jerrica had brought from their room. Can I go see my dad now? She asked Jessie. Jessie smiled. <laughs> yes, right this way. Jackson was hooked to machines, but appeared to be just sleeping. Skylar's eyes watered. I hope that they can find Sarah. I really need my dad back. Well, the pack, of course, needs their alpha too. Skylar and Mason sat with Jackson for a while. Then they decided they needed to go back to the back house and eat. As they were walking out, a young man called to them. Skylar, Mason, hey, wait up. Are you headed to the pack house? Yeah, who are you? Skylar asked defensively. Oh, um, I'm Dylan. I came from the council to help. The young man answered. Mason frowned. You look too young to be a council member. Dylan laughed. Because I'm not a council member. I'm mixed like you guys. My parents are the first fire and first airwolves. They are the council members. They haven't left the council mansion in so long they were afraid to travel. They fear they will be removed from the council for breaking their own laws. Wait, you're a child of the original wolves? They mixed elements after they forbid the world from doing so? I am a forbidden child, but I guess that makes you one as well. Skylar spoke in awe. <laughs> yeah, something like that. However, you are forbidden because you are prophesized to destroy a whole race. Um, it seems that your pack almost did that, though, not just you alone. <laughs> Dylan smiled. Mason laughed. It is weird to meet more mixed wolves. We thought we might be the only two. Dylan laughed. <laughs> uh, Tabitha and I are mates. We make up the four elements, just like the two of you. She is half earth and half ice. We never really thought anything wrong with it. However, we do have siblings that are just one element. It was a little odd learning how to fight with two elements when they only had one. Our parents weren't sure how to train us. We are grateful that we had my grandfather and Cassandra to train us. It was a lot to learn. When we needed them the most, our wolves worked together and merged. Skylar smiled. I became a 50-50 wolf. My right side was all ice, while my left side was all fire. Dylan stopped walking and just stood there looking at her for a moment. Then he asked, Um, bluish white with icy blue eye and fiery red with forest green eye? Yeah, that's exactly what she looked like. How did you know that? Mason asked concerned. Uh, there was a painting in the mansion, but Alpha Eric insisted that we bring it for Skylar to see. I wasn't sure, but my parents had it packed securely. It is in Alpha Jackson's office. Dylan started walking again. I can't wait to show it to you. There was a painter who was a seer, years ago, that painted it. It is about a hundred years old or so. Mona said someday these two will face off because they aren't aware of each other. However, now, hopefully, one will be able to find her twin and protect her. We don't know what that means, but we think it might point towards some answers. This time, Skylar stopped. A twin? I might have a twin? We honestly don't know. All we have is this painting. We pray to the moon goddess that it will point you in the right direction. Dylan said. The trio reached the pack house steps. Skylar looked at Mason, saying, I really just want something to eat and to go to bed. My love, we can do that today. Everything else can wait one more day. If you could please let everyone know we will join them tomorrow. It was nice meeting you, Dylan. Mason shook his hand and led Skylar to the kitchen. Becky smiled when they came in. Ah, I have some sandwiches, chips, and cookies if you would like. Or I can fix you something else and bring it up to your room. No, this is fine, Becky. James, I'm going to take a shower while you get this for us. Skylar leaned over and kissed Mason on the cheek. She waved to Becky and went up to her room, away from everyone's questions and wandering eyes.
heading out. Jerrica and Mitch headed to the pack house. Hey, can I stop in Alpha's room and see if I can find something that smells like Luna Sarah? If you think it will help with our search, it has been a couple of months since we last had her scent in the house. It might help us all, Jerrica said matter-of-factly. Mitch smiled. Yes, it should help us. I will see if I can find Dalton and Abby. We will meet you out in front in about half an hour. Standing up on her tippy toes, Jerrica gives Mitch a passionate kiss. I love you, and I can't wait until we can finally relax. I want to start our lives together, Jerrica sighed. Mitch laughed. Yeah, I can't wait to take you home to meet my pack. Jerrica's forest green eyes widened. I haven't thought about leaving. This has been my home almost all of my life. Her words drift off in a panicking voice. Um, we need to find Luna Sarah. Let's hurry. She takes off as fast as she can into the pack house and up the stairs. By the time Jerrica reached the fourth floor, she was crying and out of breath. What was she going to do? Skylar had healed her and made her a real person. She couldn't just leave the one person that believed in her from the beginning. Jerrica shook her head. She needed to hurry to get a few pieces of clothing that still held Sarah's scent. At least, she prayed to the moon goddess that it was the real scent of the Pax Luna. Opening Alpha Jackson's room, Jerrica walked in. Walking to the closet, she smiled as she remembered the beginning when Merlia arrived. She treated Jerrica like she was her child by brushing her hair and helping her get dressed up. Jerrica laughed at herself. It was all a ruse to get her to do her bidding. Sure, Merlia was her mother, but Jerrica was created to do her evil dues. Jerrica opened the closet and picked out a couple of Merlia's favorite outfits. She closed the door and left the room. Jerrica took a deep breath as she started down the stairs. She had wasted about 20 minutes. She hoped that they were all outside waiting for her. She didn't want to think about spending any more alone time with Mitch right now. Abby was about to head out the door when she heard Jerrica coming down the stairs. She turned and smiled. I can't believe my luck today. First, Cassandra makes me the fire guardian. Then, I find out Dalton is my mate, who I have had a crush on for a long time. <laughs> now she is sending us to find Luna to save our alpha. I am super excited and don't know how to take it all in at the same time. Abby took a breath and laughed. <laughs> I must sound like a little kid to you. <laughs> I am happy for you. I found my mate too. I wasn't even human. And now I am the air guardian. <laughs> I kind of feel like Pinocchio when he became a real boy. Jerrica laughed. Where are Mitch and Dalton? Out front waiting for us. I asked Becky to pack us some food for the road. We don't know how long we are going to be gone. She is also getting a pack of our clothes. She said she would be out in a few minutes to help strap them on the guys after we all shift. Abby was explaining. They walked out front and Jerrica held the clothes out to Mitch. These are some of Merlia's favorite shirts. The strong scent is that of a wolf. But there is still a hint of her true self as well. I guess I never noticed either scent before. Becoming a wolf has changed a lot of things for me. Dalton held out the map. We need to know where we are headed. Jerrica, you are the only one that knows where the castle is. We need a bigger map. The castle is about 200 miles or so outside of the Alaskan border. That's if we head straight through here. Jerrica pointed at the map and drew a line with her finger. However, I think it would be faster to travel this way, through the river, and head to these mountains. It should save us about an hour or so. Of course, we will need to travel in wolf form. You have never traveled in wolf form. Do you think it's safe to go this way? Mitch questioned with deep concern in his voice. He was trying to protect his mate, but she found it discouraging. Jerrica growled, rolling her eyes. 
Yes, it is safe. It is safer to travel the shortest distance. It is harder terrain, but we will get there before sunset. Dalton glanced at Abby. There was definitely some tension between Jerrica and Mitch. I will go see if I can find a map that will include that part of Canada. Dalton kissed Abby on the cheek and headed into the house. Abby watched as Dalton left. Do you think we will have any problems from the demon witches or Cordelia? Hmm, we may have some, but we killed most of her soldiers, I would think. So we shouldn't have too many to face once we arrive at the castle. I think our biggest problems will be locating Sarah once we arrive. I just hope that they didn't kill her because she was no longer useful to them. Jerrica paused for a moment. <sighs> I have a weird feeling someone is watching us. Does either of you have that feeling? Mitch nodded. Yeah, I got the same feeling when we were walking back from the hospital. I can't even pinpoint which direction it seemed to be coming from. Abby smiled and then laughed, mind-linking the two of them. <laughs> a huge owl is sitting in the tree just to your left. I noticed a couple of more in a couple of different trees. Oh, that bothers me. Jerrica answered her through the link. They must be waiting to find out if Alpha Jackson is dead. Alpha Anderson said that was what acted them right before Marge disappeared. They tore into Alpha's sides pretty bad. As Dalton walked out the door, the owl sitting just behind them flew straight for him. He threw a punch to its face before it could attack, and it blew up into ashes. What the crap was that? Dalton's eyes were wide. An owl! Abby said. How did you just punch it like that? It was like you were expecting it or something. Mitch questioned. Dalton got the faraway look in his eyes again. My wolf took over. He communicates with nature. Being an earth wolf, he connects with the ground we walk on and the trees as well. When the owl took flight, he was warned by the trees it had perched on. Becky walked out the door. Are you guys ready? I have four packs. One is your food and drinks, your clothes are in two different packs, and the last is medicine and supplies, just in case. When you undress... I will add those clothes in as well. The four guardians undressed and shifted. Becky let out a whistle. <whistles> you guys are huge. I might need a ladder to attach these. Becky attached the heavier packs to Mitch and Dalton. The smaller two were attached to Jerrica and Abby. She bid them good luck and farewell, reminding them to call whenever they had found the Luna. They looked at each other, then Jerrica took the lead, heading towards the river. They would travel all night, and hopefully arrive before sunset. Rough Journey Running at a steady pace, Jerrica leaped, landing on the other side of the river. Mitch did the same. Abby and Dalton stopped and whined. Jerrica mind-linked them. Go back a few hundred yards or so, run at full speed, and leap right at the edge. I'm afraid I will land in the middle of the river. Abby whined. Taking a moment to think, Jerrica came up with an idea. Dalton, you are the Earth Guardian. Build a stone bridge for you both to cross over on. You will have to keep it up while you cross. Do you think you can? I can try. Let me think about it. Dalton took a moment and started piecing stones together to make a stone walkway. It wasn't high above the water, but it was enough to keep them from getting wet. Abby took a deep breath, walking over the river as fast as she could. Then Dalton followed. After they were both across, the stones fell back into the water as if untouched. They continued their journey up to the mountains. They were too steep and impossible for a normal person. Even a regular wolf would have had problems. However, for the four guardian elemental wolves, this terrain was no problem at all. After a while, Jerrica stopped and looked around. 
This seemed like the perfect spot to take a break. Shifting, Jerrica said, We will rest for a while. I am sure we could all use something to eat. They all shifted and took a moment to put clothes on. They ate the sandwiches that Becky packed them. Dalton pulled out the maps and was looking. It looks like we are about here. We still need to go through this area before we cross over to Canada. Should only take another hour or so, right? Mitch looked at the maps and agreed. They hadn't talked much since they left the pack house. Jerrica stood up and stretched. <sighs> we will undress, pack up, and then before shifting, we will put the packs on our backs. Or should we do something different? Let's shift one at a time. That way, if the pack needs to be adjusted, then there is someone to adjust it. So, who will volunteer to go last? Abby asked. I will shift last. My pack is the smallest. Jerrica spoke up. Mitch smiled. I think I should shift last that way. If anyone needs help, I'll be able to help them. I have been a guardian the longest. Jerrica snarled. <sighs> I may have been a wolf the least amount of time, but I am pretty strong. I wish you would treat me as an equal. You are my mate, for goodness sakes. Dalton and Abby undressed, folded their clothes, packing them up, and kissing before shifting. Abby shifted first, Dalton making sure her pack was secure on her back. Then he placed his pack on his back and shifted. It didn't need adjusting, so they walked off a little way while Mitch and Jerrica finished their bickering. Jerrica laughed. <laughs> Dalton and Abby are ready. I will shift, and then you can, because we are done with this fight. Next time, it will be an all-out brawl. She didn't even bother to strip her clothes first. As she shifted, her clothes shredded into a few thousand pieces. Her pack was secure on her back without Mitch's help. Jerrica took off in a trot towards their destination, not even waiting for Mitch. He didn't take the time to shred his clothes either. The pack on his back shifted a little, but he was able to bite the end of the strap and pull it securely into place. As they reached the downward slope of the mountain range, they crossed over into Canada. Not really any marks to show them their location, they just felt something shift in the air. Most elemental wolves call it a wolf's sixth sense. As they neared a forest, Jerrica mind-linked them. This is the forest just west of the castle. We should arrive in the next half hour or so. Mitch smiled. Led the way, my love. Dalton and Abby exchanged a look, but didn't dare say a word. As they traveled, a heavy wind blew through the trees. The scent of Sarah passed right by them. There was no time to think as they headed towards the scent. As Sarah's scent began to get closer, Jerrica realized they were headed for the cliff. Oh no! What if Sarah had fallen or was tossed off the cliff? What if she was too injured to travel? Jerrica stopped suddenly. The cliff! However, she was a tad too late as Mitch slipped off the edge. Jerrica called on a huge gust of wind to catch him. Dalton called on the vines from the cliff edge to catch him. Between the two of them, they lifted Mitch back up to them. Jerrica wanted to laugh because Mitch was being too cocky and should have seen the cliff. He was the one who had traveled all over. Oh, you should have warned us. Mitch snapped. If you were paying attention, you would have seen the cliff. I know we have better night eyesight in wolf form than we do in human form. You act like because you traveled all over that you are better than me. However, when it comes to this trip, I am doing a better job. You need to take a moment to see what I want and what I know. You act like because I have only been a wolf for a couple of weeks that you are a king and I am a slave? You are my mate and I have already told you to treat me as your equal. Jerrica shifted as she continued yelling. We need to work together as a team. We don't know if she will be frightened and try to run or if she is hurt. Mitch shifted, holding his hands out. Uh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to make you feel that way. Abby and Dalton shifted, getting dressed and waiting for further instructions. 
Bobby, could you light a couple of branches for us to use as torches? Dalton, your pack has the medical supplies. We will need to take it down with us. Could you adjust it to fit your human body? Jericho is giving out orders. Mitch, could you create us a slide down the mountain? I know it will be cold, but it will be faster to travel that way. Mitch pulled Jerrica into a hug and kissed her passionately. I'm sorry, please. Let's work together. They all did the task that Jerrica had asked. She walked to the edge of the cliff and called on the wind and blew the trees, bushes, and rocks aside so they had a clearer path. Mitch created the slide, and they slid down to the bottom of the ravine. They spotted a small body about a dozen feet away. Jerrica pointed to Abby and motioned for her to walk with her closer to Sarah. Wait here. Let's see if she will let us get close first, Jerrica whispered. Mitch and Dalton nodded. Jerrica and Abby slowly moved towards Sarah. A small whimpering sound was coming from her, but she was too injured to move. She wouldn't be able to travel like this. Her wolf was too weak to heal her. Jerrica lowered herself down beside Sarah, holding her hands out to show that she didn't wish her any harm. I am Jerrica, and I am here to help you. I am the guardian wolf of air. Sarah held out her hand. I am Sarah. I am a fire wolf. I was being held at a castle by demon witches. I escaped when they left for a battle. However, I fell off the cliff, and I can't heal. My wolf is too weak. Abby, Dalton, Mitch, and I are here to help you. We were the pack that was attacked by the demon witches. Would it be okay if we helped you? Jerrica asked. Sarah looked at Abby and then looked at the guys standing off to the edge of the forest and nodded. Oh, yes, please. She's back. Skylar went up to their bedroom. She entered the room, not taking in any of her surroundings. She just needed a little time alone. She stripped out of her clothes, leaving them in a pile by the door. She went straight into the bathroom and into the shower. As the water heated for her shower, Skylar decided to take a hot bath instead. She plugged the tub and added in bath salts to help her relax. As she stepped into the tub, the bathroom door opened and in walked the impossible. An evil grin spread across her face. Hmm, you thought you eliminated me, didn't you? The thing is, you failed to destroy all of me. I have been waiting for you to return since you left my head out by the pack house steps. <laughs> the cackle of her laugh had Skylar scrambling out of the tub. However, Merlia grabbed her long, fiery red hair and pushed her head under the water. Skylar managed to get her bearings to fight back. She heated the water to make it steam away. It wasn't hot enough to burn her, but Merlia scurried back. You can't have both powers! You just found out that you are a wolf! This is impossible! Merlia screeched. Skylar shifted as she burst through the bathroom door. She reached out with her jaws to grab Merlia by the throat. However, Merlia anticipated it and sidestepped at the last moment, making Skylar fall to the floor. As the fight continued in the bedroom, they knocked over a lamp, causing a spark that lit the curtains on fire. Merlia tried to use the fire to burn Skylar, but she froze it. Merlia grabbed Skylar's neck, trying to throw her out the window. Skylar took the opportunity to grab Merlia's arm and fling her out the window instead. She jumped the three floors to the ground and landed on top of Merlia. A demon doesn't just die, Skylar. You will never win this battle. If your pack hadn't blown the ashes of the demons in all different directions, we would have been able to rebuild our army 
As it is now, Mother and Marge think that I am dead because of you. Merlia was screaming as she continued to kick and punch at Skylar. Skylar was holding her in wolf form, but decided this fight was one better fought in human form. She shifted and grabbed Merlia around the neck, calling on Sky's fire and Zara's ice powers. Merlia's eyes rolled back into her head, but then she knocked Skylar off her feet. Mason came running up to his room to find his window broken, along with several things in his room destroyed. He stomped out the curtains before looking out the window and was frozen at the unbelievable sight of Merlia and Skylar fighting. By this point, several others had begun to gather in the backyard of the pack house. The wolves stood in shock at what they were seeing. Skylar had killed Merlia. How were they fighting now? Instead of attacking to kill her, Skylar decided they would capture her. She closed her eyes and called upon the ice to surround her wrist on both sides. Mason, seeing what Skylar was doing, called upon the earth for vines to pull her arms together for Skylar to finish forming the ice handcuffs on Merlia's wrists. It didn't work. Merlia could transform into a crow, but Skylar was fast enough to catch her before she could fly off. She burned her wings, keeping her from being able to fly. Merlia cawed as she turned back into her human form. Being part demon didn't help with the fire. In fact, it made her more scared of it. Mason grabbed Merlia, holding her to keep her from escaping. Cassandra walked up and looked at her. Merlia, my dear niece, I thought you were dead. I see you have some tricks up your sleeve. What are we going to do now? I will create a cage for her. Cassandra went down to the basement, calling upon stones and vines and creating only small holes for her to see and breathe through. Merlia was angry that the bars were so thick and she couldn't even put her hands through them. Cassandra cast a spell on Merlia to keep her from shifting or being able to use her powers. We will need to keep two guards outside the cell to make sure that nothing happens to her, Skylar said. Cassandra nodded. I agree. We don't want to take any chances. Merlia smiled. No matter what you do to this cage, nothing will stop my mother and sister for getting revenge for my death. Mason grabbed Skylar's shoulders as she lunged for the cage. Merlia's laughter followed them all the way back to the Alpha's office. Dylan walked over to the package lying on the table. He and Betty unwrapped the painting. Skylar just stared at it. Mason's eyes widened in shock. That's what Skylar looked like the night we thought we destroyed Merlia. 50% ice wolf and 50% fire wolf. One forest green eye, one icy blue eye. This one is Skylar. He pointed to the wolf that was standing in the snow and ice. Who's this other wolf that is like a mirror image of her? Eric walked over to the painting. There is something we must tell you. We were hoping to tell you when Jackson was better, but it seems now is the best time to do so. Everyone sat in silence, waiting for what was about to come. The night Scala was born, Melissa had a hard labor. They decided that a C-section would be best. When they opened her up, there was a twin. Dustin, her mate, took the twin, saying that she had died. She was technically born first, however, Schuyler was stuck in the birthing canal, so Schuyler was supposed to be the first twin born. Eric paused to let that process. We now believe that Dustin has kept your twin hidden away. He said, looking at Schuyler. Cassandra took a deep breath. Dustin is a hybrid. He is half wolf and half demon witch. He is Marge's son. They sent him to be raised by his father's family after Cordelia killed him. 
Marge has not seen him in over 20 years. Everyone stared at Cassandra in frozen shock. Dustin had taken the twin because the prophecy said the firstborn daughter of the Fire Princess and the Ice Prince would destroy all demon witches. Melissa is the Fire Princess. Jackson is the Ice Prince. Anderson stated with his head down. Skylar stood up, shouting, What are we talking about? Anderson held up his hand. Oh, give me a moment, please. My father is the king of all last wolves in the world. He denounced his crown to keep Jackson and me safe. However, it looks like it was all for naught. Eric said, walking over to his father. The current king is my cousin. The queen is my mate, Josephine. She is Eric and Jackson's mother. I wanted to tell them both before now. It was just not enough time. Josephine is not married to Robert, and she knows that I am still alive. I am vowed to return to my position after the end of the demon witches. Anderson's eyes looked up to Skylar. Granddaughter, please forgive me. You are the princess of half of the elemental wolves. James Mason, you are the prince of the other half. Mason's eyes opened in shock. What? Cassandra stood up. I think it is time you both know the whole truth. And what this means for the both of you. Earning her trust. After slowly carrying Sarah to the top of the hill, Jerrica lowered her to the ground as she helped Mitch and Dalton up. Abby was standing about 100 yards away, on the phone with someone back at the back. We can't get her home in this condition. She's too weak to travel. Jerrica glanced over her shoulder. We need to find shelter. I don't know how long Sarah has been out in the elements. Her wolf is too weak to heal her. Mitch looked around. Dalton and I will go and find somewhere safe for us to stay for a few days. Dalton nodded. You and Abby collect some branches and start a fire. Keep Sarah as warm as you can, huh? Please hurry. I know daylight is almost upon us. I don't know how far she has made it from the castle where they are keeping her. They may be looking for her. We don't want to take any chances. Jerrica hugged Mitch tight. Please be careful, she whispered in his ear. Dalton and Mitch went in search of decent shelter for a few days. Abby returned from her phone call. Cassandra said that she would send Jesse and Erica, one of the nurses. They will bring a helicopter to make it easier to move Sarah back to the pack hospital. Skylar wants to come. But something is going on, and Skylar said she isn't leaving pack territory until it is taken care of. However, she wouldn't give me any details. Just to see if we can find shelter and keep Sarah warm until Jesse arrives. The guys went to find shelter. Do you want to stay here while I find some branches to start a fire? Asked Jerrica as she looked over at Sarah. She was sleeping now. Abby nodded. Okay. I won't go far, in case you need me. <laughs> you look like you could use the warmth yourself. Jerrica smiled as she rubbed Abby's arms. Abby smiled back. <laughs> I'll be okay. Just go and find something to start the fire. I will do the rest. Jerrica left in search of dried branches and kindling. After about 15 minutes, she decided that she had enough for now. Arriving back where Abby and Sarah were, she found that Abby had fallen asleep next to Sarah. She gently nudged Abby. Abby, wake up! I need you to start the fire, Jerrica said. Abby yawned. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to fall asleep. I guess I was more tired than I thought. Jerrica laughed. <laughs> if I weren't moving, I would fall asleep too. Abby held her hands over the kindling and branches and threw a few sparks. It caught fire and started burning. Jerrica sat on the ground and wrapped her arms around Abby. 
They sat in silence, trying to keep each other warm while watching over Sarah. They had bandaged Sarah's wounds the best that they could with what they had. They gave her medicine for the pain and then wrapped her in blankets to give her heat. Sarah didn't say much. She seemed scared of them, even after they started helping her. About an hour and a half had passed since Mitch and Dalton had left. Jerrica was starting to worry and was getting hungry. She decided to fix them all something to eat. She hoped that Sarah would wake up long enough to eat as well. Jerrica cooked the ham and grits that Becky had packed. She hoped that Jesse would arrive soon. They were running low on food. Mitch walked up, smiling. We found shelter, but I don't know if Sarah will be willing for us to use it. What do you mean? Jerrica questioned. It's Cordelia's castle. It is abandoned, not a soul in sight. Dalton and I walked through every room and upstairs. We even checked the roof. There is no sign of anyone. It appears it has been empty for some time. Mitch looked over at Sarah, concerned. I just hope that she will agree to it. Abby stood up and walked over to Mitch and Jerrica. I don't know if she will or not, but getting her inside will be her best bet. Uh, where is Dalton? He's starting a fire and seeing if there is any food. I see that we have a hot food already. <laughs> have you been able to get her to eat anything yet? Mitch asked. Jerrica shook her head. I was finishing up when you arrived. I haven't tried to wake her up to eat yet. About that time, Dalton came walking up. I got the fire going. There is some food, but I don't know what we can fix with what we have. Let's eat this and see if we can get Sarah to eat. While we eat, we can let her know what the plans are. She may refuse to go back there, but we have to try, Jerrica said. Jerrica and Abby fixed plates for Mitch and Dalton. Abby fixed Sarah's plate while Jerrica went to wake her up. Sarah, honey, are you hungry? Jerrica asked quietly as she gently shook Sarah's shoulder. Sarah opened her eyes slowly. Yes, please. Abby handed Sarah the plate and waited for her to eat. Jerrica took out the apple cider and heated it over the fire. Pouring some in a cup, she offered it to Sarah. Then poured the other four cups full. Sarah ate slowly. She was almost too weak to eat. Jerrica mind-linked the others. I hope that Jessie is bringing some IV fluids for her. She is much too weak. They all nodded in agreement. Sarah, Mitch and Dalton found shelter. However, we are worried you will refuse it. Jerrica said softly. It is the castle. I know. I heard you talking. I am too weak to fight you. Do you think it is safe? Or... If you are leading me back to my death, there is nothing I can do about it. Sarah answered sadly. They all shared a look. Dalton stood. Sarah, we want to keep you safe. We would never cause you any harm. We don't want to scare you, but maybe we need to tell you. Dalton, no! Jerrica shouted. Mitch looked over at her. We need to tell her the truth. How else are we going to get her to trust us? Jerrica shook her head. But what if it isn't true? What if it is just another of Merlia's tricks? Merlia, you know her, Sarah said weakly. Jerrica took a deep breath. Yes, she pretended to be you. She tricked our Alpha into thinking she was his mate. However... We think that since she was channeling you, that you are his true mate. No, I can't be. My mate was killed by the demon witches when they came to my pack's land. I mean, he wasn't my fated mate, but he was my chosen mate. Sarah looked sad as she remembered. They killed every member of my family. They killed all. Except for a handful of the females. They were using us to find a certain wolf. However, no other wolf was strong enough to withstand the channeling. I am the last of my pack. 
They tortured us. I was tortured the worst. But I vowed to live to see my revenge. Sarah stopped and looked at each of their faces. They didn't show pity. They showed understanding. Then she continued. They left for the big battle. They all left. Marge had become my friend. She wasn't mean like Merlia or Cordelia. She would feed me or would get Tilly to bring me food. That night, Marge unlocked the silver shackles. She told me that I had to wait until there was silence, then run as fast as I could away from there. I waited for what seemed like hours. There was no other person in the castle. I checked every room as you did. I stole food and clothes. When I fell into the ravine, I lost them. I am sorry that we weren't able to help you sooner. We didn't know you were still alive, Jerrica said as she wiped tears away. Then Sarah's eyes flashed angrily for a brief moment. You are Merlia's minion. I remember you now. A couple of times a year, you would come to the castle and bring some poison to me. You made me weak to make sure she could channel me. You are going to kill me. I just know it. Mitch stood up and walked over to Jerrica as she sobbed. Abby looked at Sarah. She isn't a minion anymore. She is now the air guardian. Cassandra, our maker, made her whole. She is one of us now. Mitch is her mate. I am so sorry. It wasn't something I wanted to do. Merlia had me under a spell. But thanks to Skylar, she helped me break free of the spell. She is a healer. Over the 12 years that Merlia was there forcing me to do her bidding, Skylar slowly healed me. She was giving me part of herself every time she hugged me or cried on my shoulder. <laughs> Merlia kept the whole pack under his spell, but Skylar was able to break it on her 18th birthday. Jerrica explained through her sobs. Overwhelming Truth Cassandra held out the book that she had brought with her. Skylar, you started reading. However, you only read about the first eight wolves. There is so much more. I know you looked at the prophecy that includes you. But did you read the whole thing? Skylar looked down at the book. I thought I did. It says that a forbidden union of the Fire Princess with the Ice Prince will conceive a child. This will be no ordinary child. It will be a girl. Her eyes will be the color of ice. Her hair, the color of the flames of a fire. She will not deny her ice heritage or her fire heritage. She will force her two wolves to work together as one. Her mate will be that from a forbidden union, but not foreseen by anyone other than me. His mother is the heir princess, while his father is the last surviving Earth King. They both will be kept in the dark until the time is right. They will fight the demon witches, but will fail. They will need two others to help them complete the task, two that come from the council, one of which is air and fire, while the other is earth and ice. The four of them will need to combine all their powers to finish what the first two have started. Cassandra paused. That will include destroying Cordelia as well. Tabitha and Dylan shared a look of confusion. Why are we needed to finish such a job? We have never trained for war. Dylan asked, concerned. Tabitha nodded. My mother told me that this day would come. She told me that I was meant for something far greater than she was able to train me for. Mason stood. Why did no one ever tell me about my dad being a king? He was always the baiter of the pack. I didn't know he was anything else. And my mom, she just... 
left. She, she went home to her parents' house. Why didn't she tell me that they are king and queen of the airwolves? The more questions Mason asked, the angrier he grew. None of this makes any sense. I know there were different elements because I have been able to use both air and earth. However, now you're telling me they are royalty as well? Cassandra walked closer and laid her hands on his shoulders. They were afraid to tell you the truth. When your father died, your mother had no choice but to return to the Air Kingdom. She wanted you to go with her, but you insisted that your job was here. Your father knew that Skylar was your mate from the day she had arrived, but he couldn't tell you. That would have meant he was telling you truly who he was. If he was king, why didn't he fight for his people, huh? It seems that he just abandoned them. He was supposed to protect them and make sure they were safe. Crying, Mason questioned. My dad was a coward. James, your dad was a hero, even if he was the last one standing in the end. He saved the Air Kingdom from being attacked. He lost all of his people, but he fought right beside them. He led them into battle because they had trained for the fight together. He refused to stay behind. The strongest soldiers stayed behind to protect the women and children. He lost his chosen mate and your half-brother and sister in that battle. Cassandra stopped and thought about everything she was telling him. Mason went from crying to being outraged. He stormed out of the conference room. Skylar running after him. James, wait! Skylar called out to him. Baby, I, I, I just need a minute. My dad was mated to another woman, and I have siblings that I can never meet or know anything about. My dad was a king, and my mom is a princess, or possibly a queen now. This is just too much. I know I need to learn all these things. I, uh, I just need a minute. Mason smiled. Then he wrapped Skylar in a hug and cried. His dad had been through so much, and they had to keep the secrets. Now, after his dad passed away, he heard all of these details. His mom left and said it was because of too many memories. But what was the truth? Mason pulled his phone out of his pocket, looking at it. He called his mom. After a few seconds, she answered. Hey, Mom, is there any way you can come for a visit? Mason asked. Yes, son. I think I need to. Cassandra just called and told me that you need me. I'm going to see if your grandparents can come as well. His mom answered. Okay, I wish you and Dad would have told me. Why did I have to learn about all these things like this? Mason asked. I just can't... Skylar took the phone. Hello, this is Skylar. I am sorry, but I think James needs a minute to collect his thoughts. Skylar, honey, I am so glad that you two are finally mated. You both were born for each other, his mom said. Skylar looked at Mason. We haven't mated yet, ma'am. We are hoping to have a ceremony. We want it to be special. Maybe we can have that while you are here. Hopefully... My dad, Alpha Jackson, will be better by then. His mom replied, That would be lovely. I will love to be a part of it, if that's okay with James. Jeremiah would have loved to be there as well. I know, Miss Anna Marie, I know. We will see you soon then? Skylar asked. Yes, I will leave at once. I am hoping my parents will come with me. They have never met James. It would be a blessing for us to see him. Skylar, please take care of him. I know you love him very much. Anna Marie said. Skylar nodded. Yes, ma'am, I do. He means the world to me. <laughs> I guess I have always known that he did. See you soon. Anna Marie replied as she hung up. Mason reached for Skylar's hands. She is coming. I can't wait to see her. 
I feel so torn between the anger and the love that I have for her. I hope she will be able to give me more answers. He shook his head. I don't want to hear anything else from Cassandra. I know she means well, but I... I can't go back in there. Skylar gave him a slight smile. She understood. Hmm, I know. However, I need to learn what I can. My dad is in a coma. And my mom is hundreds of miles away. Uncle Eric said that she is not answering her phone. Aunt Lisa left this morning to go back home and see if she can get my mom to come here. However, since her maid is Dustin, Cassandra's nephew, who knows what has happened to my mom? Getting to know each other. After arriving at the castle, Sarah seemed to get more skittish, but she's thankful for a warm place to sleep. Jerrica tries to give her some space. She still is uneasy around her. While looking back at the castle, Jerrica comes across the room where she was created. Walking into the room, Jerrica sat down in the chair facing the window. She had lost a lot of herself in this very room. Jerrica took a deep breath as she tried to fight back the tears that were beginning to swell. A knock on the door pulled her attention away from her memories. Yes, Jerrica said as she stood from the chair, wiping her tears away. Mitch walked in. Hi, what's wrong? I was made in this room. Merle has spent a lot of time with me. I know we haven't really talked much about our backgrounds. Maybe we should, Jerrica said, looking down at her hands. Mitch wrapped his arms around her and kissed the top of her head. He cleared his throat. Yeah, we should. Waiting for Jesse to arrive. I think we may have some time now. Jerrica took a deep breath, looking around the room. Merlia, Mom, as I called her, until she sent me away to do her bidding, she had gotten into some trouble because she had killed her sister's mate. He was the head guard for the Firewolves' kingdom. He worked directly for the king and queen. Cordelia had sent Merlia to bring her sister back home, and I don't know the whole story, but in the end, she killed him. Marge was pregnant when she was dragged back home. She didn't want anything to do with her evil plot. However, Merlia was locked in this room with only her potions, poisons, powders, and stuff. She created me out of her trash, leftovers, dust and stuff. Then she would destroy me within minutes. I remember each and every time. Finally, one day, she decided to keep me. Jerrica paused, looking out the window. The window was very narrow, no wider than six inches and about 30 inches long. You keep looking at the window. What is so special about it? Mitch asked. The day that she decided to keep me? She asked me to stand at the window. I was the size of a two- or three-year-old child. When I did, Mom asked for my hand. I held it out to her because I didn't know what she was going to do. She cut off my fingers one at a time. Then she formed more girls, just like me. They look like me, and they talk like me. I wanted to name them. She said that my name was Maria. I couldn't name the other ones. However, one day, she left me with my clone. I named her Cassandra. Mom smashed her into thousands of pieces. I was forbidden ever to speak that name again. Then, Cordelia, Granny, found out about me and my clones. She had them all sent out to different packs in search of the forbidden child. They would stay there and become part of the pack. And she would spy on the packs through their eyes. As I started to grow, Granny decided that I needed to be sent out too. She sent me to Alpha Jackson's pack. That's where I met Skylar. Everything was going well until I turned six in wolf years. I was about three in minion years. 
Anyway, Mom couldn't see through my eyes anymore. It was getting blurrier the longer I stayed. That's when she told me that Skylar was the forbidden child. Mom came to bring me back home. However, she used Sarah's body through channeling. When she walked onto the pack territory, Sarah's scent called to Alpha Jackson. They were mates. She did all kinds of things to Skylar. She poisoned her, gave her wolf's bane and fox bluff. It made her wolves suppressed to the point Skylar believed she was human. Jerrica paused as she smells Sarah outside the door. Sarah came through the door. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to listen. Who is Alpha Jackson? He is your fated mate. At least, we think he is. You seem to be doing better. Mitch said. Jesse arrived with some medicine to help my wolf get stronger to help me heal. She told me to walk around a little bit to see if I was getting stronger. I really didn't mean to eavesdrop. Sarah twisted her hands. Are you going to take me to meet Alpha Jackson? Jerrica nodded. We were hoping you would want to meet him. Sarah's eyes widened. What if he doesn't like me? What if I'm not actually his mate? Will the pack accept me after everything Merlia did? She started shaking and crying. I don't know if I can. I'm worried about what he will think of me. Sarah, no one has to know you were there. Alpha Jackson can't reject you. He is in a coma. Jerrica hugged Sarah. What happened? Sarah questioned. Mitch shook his head. During the battle with the demon witches, they used giant owls. They attacked him, almost killing him. However, they were able to save him. He stopped for a moment and looked at Jerrica. He was in pretty bad shape. Skylar healed him, Jerrica said. Skylar must be a powerful healer then, Sarah said, confused. Jerrica nodded. She was powerful enough to make me almost whole, to make me human. Skylar is Alpha Jackson's daughter. Sarah smiled. If he is my mate, I have a daughter. What are they like? Skylar is the kindest, smartest, most easygoing wolf I have ever known. Alpha Jackson is stern, but he has a huge heart. I am still trying to get to know the real Alpha Jackson. Merlia had him under a spell for so long that I don't remember him from before. Jerrica said, smiling. Sarah held out her hand to Jerrica. I think I want to give him a try. Will you stay with me when I meet Alpha Jackson and Skylar? Jerrica smiled. Yes, I will. Skylar's Heritage Mason kissed Skylar. I love you. I can't wait for you to meet my mom. <laughs> I am so excited to meet her. I hope that your grandparents decide to travel with her. I know you would love to meet them. Skylar smiled. Someone behind them cleared their throat. <clears throat> we are waiting for you. If you would like to continue... Cassandra smiled. I am ready, James. Let's do this together. Skylar turned to look at him. Mason nodded. As long as everything else, my mom can tell me when she arrives. I think it is private. I wish I hadn't been lied to all these years. Skylar started walking toward the conference room. She reached behind her and grabbed Mason's hand to give him strength. When they entered, she said... We apologize for the interruption. Cassandra, will you please continue? Anderson stood up and took a breath. I want to tell you my history and where I come from. My father and mother were the king and queen of the Ice Kingdom. They were fair and just to our people. When I turned 18, I found my mate, Stella. She was the most beautiful wolf I had ever seen. She was a few years older than me and a handmaid to Hazel, my older sister. I had known her almost all of my life. 
She grew up in the palace. Her mother was my mother's handmaid. We had our mating ceremony within the week. Everything was so wonderful. Stella was happy and content. A few months later, she found out she was expecting. Jackson was born, and everything began to change. She didn't want him to grow up in the public's eye. I convinced her that things would settle down in a couple of years. Then she got pregnant again, this time with Eric. She told me that she couldn't do it anymore. She knew she couldn't live without me, but for the children, she would leave. I was heartbroken. I was to be named king within a year. I had a meeting with my father, and he decided that my brother and I would trade places. We are twins, so no one knew the wiser. They kept which of us was older a secret for all those years. Stella and I left the castle and moved here. Father made me an alpha of our pack. You should be king, not Uncle Edward? Eric asked in shock. Yes, son. Your mother wanted you to have a normal as possible life. She refused to raise you as royalty. Anderson said. Skylar laughed. <laughs> I guess that makes me the Ice Wolf Princess, huh? Cassandra nodded. Yes. However, that isn't all. Melissa is the Fire Princess, which is why she and your father didn't marry. Well, that was part of it. The other part is that they weren't fated mates, but chosen mates. They never had their ceremony, and her father forced her to return home. After she returned home, she discovered she was pregnant with you and your twin. My nephew, Dustin, is her fated mate. He is a demon witch wolf. His destiny was to stop you from killing his coven. The best we can tell is that he kidnapped and killed your twin. Melissa went into labor and was unable to give birth naturally. She was forced to have a C-section. Your sister was the first pulled from the womb. However, you were already in the birth canal, which means you were supposed to be born first. Dustin doesn't know this, or at least didn't at the time. We do not know if he killed your twin or what he has done with her. Unless Cordelia is in contact with him, he may not know that he made a mistake. At this time, the Fire King and Queen are in an uproar because your mother has gone missing. They want to come to meet you and bring Melissa with them. Your Aunt Lisa arrived yesterday evening. An investigation is underway. They will find your mother. Skylar sat down and laughed. <laughs> Why does everything have to go wrong? She shook her head. What if this painting is true and my sister is still out there? Are she and I going to have to fight each other? Is Dustin missing as well? Yes, I am afraid that he is. They think that he may have taken her somewhere. If your sister is still alive, he may be holding her somewhere near the Fire Palace. That may be where he took Melissa as well, Cassandra stated. Skylar put her head in her hands. After a few minutes, she looked at Mason. You are the prince of both the Air and Earth Kingdoms. I am the princess of both the Ice and Fire Kingdoms. <laughs> that means that all four elemental kingdoms will be united after our mating ceremony. <laughs> that is just insane! Dylan stood up. The council would love to officiate the mating ceremony between the two of you. Any of us have the power to make it official. Also, I will call our parents and let them know that the four kingdoms will unite with this union. We will stay to take care of everything, and then have the paperwork sent out to all the kingdoms to declare it so. Betty smiled. I will not move forward with any ceremony until my father is out of a coma and my mother is found stated Skylar. Mason nodded. I will not move forward without the same and my mother's arrival. My father can't be here, but we will display a picture of him. The Earth Kingdom may have been destroyed. However, I will make sure that it will live on. Everyone in the conference room agreed to follow Skylar and Mason's wishes. 
After all, they couldn't have a ceremony without the two guests of honor. Skylar bid everyone good night. James, I'm going to our room. There has been so much to take in, and everything is so stressful. Um, I have to tell you that we will be moving up to the fourth floor at least until our room can be repaired. Mason said. Oh, I forgot all about Merlia. What is the council going to do about her? Skylar questioned. Andre said. Father stated that she needs to transfer to the council house. However, we are not sure that this is the right choice. We will hold her here for a couple of days and let you two make the decision. In the end, you are even higher than our parents. Mason turned around confused. Hmm? What do you mean? Tabitha laughed. <laughs> the first four sets of wolves created the kingdoms. When they split up, their older children took over the kingdoms. Which means they are older than the council. So... That gives the two of you power over the council. Merlia's fate is in your hands. She must die. Everything seemed to be turning around. Sarah had been located and was on the mend. She should be in the pack territory within the next couple of hours. Cordelia and Marge had disappeared, and no one seemed to know where they were. That was both good and bad. However, Merlia was still locked away in the pack prison, awaiting her fate. Aunt Lisa had called. They had located Melissa. She wasn't doing well. Her mate beat her pretty badly and left her for dead. Skylar's grandparents were bringing Melissa to the Snowy Range Pack territory. They knew she would be safer here. Skylar was nervous about meeting all of them. Mason's mom and grandparents were on their way and were due to arrive in the next day or two. It seemed that since Cassandra and part of the council were here at the Snowy Range Pack, they would be safest here. The main thing that worried Skylar and Cassandra was that Dustin was missing. There were no signs of him anywhere. The pack warriors were going to keep searching. He had to turn up sooner or later. Skylar was sitting on her bed in the room that she and Mason moved into a few nights ago. Mason had gone to take care of some pack business since Jackson was still in a coma. Skylar was getting dressed to see her dad. His condition hadn't changed, but they were hopeful about Sarah's arrival soon. Skylar walked out of her room. Heading down the stairs, she got an uneasy feeling. She turned around to see Cassandra standing there. Oh, Cassandra, you scared me. Skylar said. Cassandra walked forward. I didn't mean to. I was hoping that we could talk. Skylar still had that feeling. She answered Cassandra. Sure, let's go down to the kitchen. I was hoping we could sit in your room and talk, Cassandra said. Cassandra, I really would rather go get something to eat. Aren't you hungry? Skylar's voice came out strained. Skylar was beginning to get this overwhelming feeling. She felt like her lungs were being crushed. As she reached for the railing to catch herself, she missed and tumbled down the steps. Skylar came to a stop on the landing with a crash. She looked up at Cassandra and saw the flash in her eyes. Footsteps were running up the stairs below. Skylar tried to move. Cassandra had her frozen in place. She couldn't wrap her head around why Cassandra was doing this to her. Skyla, are you all right? Cassandra asked from behind her. Skylar turned her head as Cassandra lifted her eyes and was met with her own eyes staring back at her. The two Cassandras looked at each other for a brief moment. How did you manage? The one standing behind Skylar said. It was easy, as I got stronger. I began to take over the god's mind. <laughs> you thought your politrix would work on me, said the Cassandra standing just above Skylar. Skylar still couldn't catch her breath. The Cassandra above her laughed. <laughs> I have her under a lung-crushing spell. If you don't let me go, I will kill her with a snap of my fingers. If you were going to kill her, you already would have. 
Why don't you drop the act and reveal your true self? The real Cassandra said. The other Cassandra laughed. <laughs> if I did that, when the gods reach the steps in a moment, they would know who is who. This will make them question themselves. Cassandra knew she had to do something to not only help Skylar, but make it possible for the guards to see through Merlia's disguise. Cassandra mind-linked Mason. James, you need to come to the third floor landing. Merlia has escaped and is disguised as me. I am standing on the landing with Skylar to my right. She is still standing on the last step. She has Skylar under a spell that can kill her if we don't act fast. Mason answered. What do I need to do? Let her think that you believe she is the real Cassandra. Have the guards arrest me, but have them let me go. Take her back to the office. The council members will know what to do with her. I know they said that the choice is yours and Skylar's, but we must act now. Cassandra mind linked back. The guards came running up. You are under arrest for treason. Posing as our maker and breaking out of prison. This time we will not let you get away with it. They put the handcuffs on the real Cassandra and led her away as Mason ran up the steps. Skylar's eyes widened. She was still under the spell. She couldn't tell him that he had made a huge mistake. That was the real Cassandra, Skylar told him through the mind link. You will be okay. Cassandra, please come with me. Mason said as he picked Skylar up. He walked towards the Alpha's office and led Cassandra inside. Immediately after entering the office, the doors were slammed shut, and the four council members were standing before them. Cassandra began to panic. She didn't know who these wolves were. How was she going to pull this off? Betty smiled. Cassandra, are you okay? I can't believe that Merlia broke out of prison and pretended to be you. Yeah, I am fine, she said, a little startled. Cassandra, why don't you have a seat? I will get you a glass of water. Andre said. This gave her no choice but to take a seat. She was looking around, confused, but was trying to hide it. Dylan walked over to the chair where she was sitting and pulled the one beside her out. My love, I'm so glad that you are okay. Hey, I am okay. Honey, thank you, Cassandra said. As they continued to dote on Cassandra, the spell on Skylar began to lessen, and she was able to breathe again. Well, I guess we need to decide Merlia's fate now. What do you think, James? Skylar? Betty asked. Yes, I think we need to decide. Skylar, baby, what do you think we should do? She impersonated Cassandra. She broke out of prison and attacked the Ice and Fire Kingdom's princess. Mason said, looking at Skylar. Skylar was finally able to talk again. I think Cassandra should decide. What do you think should happen to your niece, Cassandra? Panic crossed her face. I think we should kill her at once. Have the guards bring her to the clearing by the river. We should kill her there. That sounds like the perfect plan. We should head over there now. Dylan, will you inform the guards and warriors of the plan? We will want the whole pack present for this, Mason said. Skylar walked over to Cassandra. I will walk with you. Everyone else will follow us. Um, I thought I would go change before we went to kill my niece. Shouldn't I wear black or something? She asked nervously. You can change afterward. We want to get this over with now. We have waited a week longer than we had planned. It won't take long, and I know what to do this time. Skylar said as she smiled. Skylar linked her arm with Cassandra's and led her out to the clearing by the river. Everyone else from the pack was waiting, including Cassandra. Pulling the imposter Cassandra onto the stage, she said, This Cassandra had decided the fate of the imposter. She will be killed here immediately. We will show no mercy. She has committed treason by impersonating our maker. She attacked the daughter of our Alpha, and she broke out of prison. Is there anyone here who wants to speak on her behalf? All the pack members looked at each other, but no one said anything. 
Mason walked forward with the real Cassandra. Skylar, Tabitha, Dylan, and I will give her sentence together. Are you guys ready? They all nodded. They lifted their hands and began the execution right there in front of the whole pack. First, parts of her body burned and then froze over. Then, they turned to stone and then to ash as they blew away in the wind. They watched the imposter Cassandra change back to Merlia as they destroyed her from her toes to the top of her head. Stop! How could you know it was me? This was supposed to be the real Cassandra. Stop! Merlia screamed as her body was torn apart by each element and thrown into different directions. They were not taking any chances of her ever coming back again. Thank you for listening to another episode. Hopefully you'll tune in for another episode, which is episode 11. Well, I'll read chapter 41. I mean, play chapter 41 through 50.